invite you to open up your Bibles unless they're still there. Open them back up to Proverbs chapter 2. We're going to read that in a couple seconds. I appreciate the men in taking part in worship this morning. I do want to apologize to Paul and Sammy and Levi. Anytime there's a mix-up with this, that's always my fault. That's always mine. I'm the one who compiles the slides, and sometimes I get a little sloppy with them. So I apologize about that. I apologize to them in for that awkward moment there a second ago. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 2 in just a couple of seconds. This is, as everyone knows, and especially if you are of age, you know exactly what this month is, which is graduation month. This is when every year millions upon millions of people, whether you're in trade schools, college, uh, whether you're high school senior, whatever it is, kindergarten graduation, which we have coming up tomorrow. This is the time period every single year where all these people walk across the stage, grab a diploma, and move on to the next phase of their life. And if you've ever been to a graduation, you've never graduated anything, I have a little spoiler for you. It's really exciting for about three seconds. And then the rest of it is literally you sitting in this massive coliseum where you watch 8,000 other people walk across the stage. If you're taking part in it, you know especially the pain that I'm talking about here. But you sit there and you watch every other person take the next stage of their life. But what will inevitably happen at every graduation ceremony, except for kindergarten graduation, at least not that I'm aware of, is the commencement address. And I have been to several of these in my lifetime. I've been to one as a student. I've been to one as an observer. And I will tell you that I don't remember a thing that anyone talked about. I remember going to one high school graduation with my friends, and George Foreman was the speaker. And all I remember thinking was, wow, that's George Foreman right there. Don't remember a thing that he talked about. But there are some commencement addresses, though. The reason why it's called the commencement address is to help you get the next stage, commence the next stage of your life. There are some commencement addresses that really, I think, go above and beyond. For instance, when you look at some of the most legendary commencement speeches in life, to me, nothing tops 2005 Steve Jobs' Stanford commencement address. If you've never heard that, I would encourage you all to go watch it on YouTube. You can fast forward to the parts that you don't want. That's the advantage of virtual ceremonies. But it's a great address that talks about living boldly, it talks about fear and about how we need to push forward and live dangerously all within kind of a certain context. He does a masterful job at that. You also have the late, great Chadwick Boseman that delivered a speech to Howard <laughs> University several years ago. Great speech, great commencement address. You also, and I can never figure out if it's J.K. Rowling, J.K. Rowling, I always say Rowling. J.K. Rowling gives this commencement address, just really captures the attention. But I thought to myself, what would you, who would you want to have as your commencement speaker? You could have anybody in the world who would you want to have. Certainly these candidates top the list, but I thought to myself, what if Solomon was a commencement speaker? What if King Solomon was at your high school, your senior, your college, your trade school graduation? What if he came to your graduation and imparted words of wisdom? What are some of those things that he would say? He's obviously super qualified for the job. He's fantastically rich, which seems to be a qualification for a lot of people, the only qualification. He's extremely wise. He's very successful on a worldly basis. He was able to navigate political alliances. He was able to erect these massive building projects. So from a worldly perspective, Solomon is fabulously successful. What are some of the things that he would say? The very first thing he would say before we get into the other things I think he would say, as evidenced by Proverbs chapter 2, is the fact that we never need to stop learning. Look at what he says here in Proverbs chapter 2. There's a reason we're bringing this out at the beginning. He says, my son, if you will receive my words, and if you will treasure my commandments within you, if you will make your ear attentive to wisdom, if you incline your heart to understanding, if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver, search for rest for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord, and you will discover the knowledge of God. Before Solomon embarks in this massive 31-chapter section about wisdom and about its application in every life, he starts by beginning to emphasize the necessity of continual learning. There are so many people that get to the graduation stage of their life, and they think to themselves at 16, 17, 18 years old, I've got it all nailed, and I am on my way. Solomon says that is the most dangerous path you can ever take. One of my favorite professors I ever had in any college or any class of any kind is Dr. Powell from Emerald College. He's my history professor, if that tells you anything about the path that I chose. And Dr. Powell was in his office one time, and he told me, Brady, there are two types of PhDs in this world. There are those who think that they know everything, and they stop learning. And then there are those who are scared to death that everyone will realize how little they actually do know and never stop learning. You always want to be in that second camp. The reason for that is very obvious. If, you don't, if you're in that camp that thinks to yourself, I've got it all locked down, and there are some people that are like that. I've got it locked down. I know exactly how the world operates. 
I know exactly what I need to do. I know exactly my relationship with God. There's no growth potential there. If that's your attitude, then you will not hear another word of this lesson. If you don't listen to what he says in Proverbs chapter 2, you're not going to listen to what he says in Proverbs chapter 7 or chapter 9 or chapter 13. There's no growth there. And so right at the outset, what Solomon says is you need to have the humility to understand that life is a continual growth process, that there's always going to be things that we need to learn, whether that's academic, whether it's application, there's always going to be some way that we need to grow. Which brings me to the first thing, that if I were Solomon, which of course I'm not because I don't have the long flowing robes, if I were Solomon, what would I say to a graduating class in 2022? The very first thing that I would say is to look for lessons in everyday objects. The secret about school is not really a secret at all. School is the formal education and accumulation of knowledge. And that means that life is the informal accumulation of wisdom. The things that we learn in everyday life, the things that we learn when we're sitting in those desks and we're writing with our number two pencil, our big cheap tablet, or writing on our Chromebooks, whatever it is, that's the formal accumulation of knowledge. But the application of that is what we call wisdom in the world around us. And Solomon does this on a masterful level. He doesn't talk about going to these far off reaches of the universe. You don't need to climb Mount Everest to look for wisdom and to search for it. Solomon makes the argument over and over again in the book of Proverbs that it's found in everyday life. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. He almost encourages his readers, his listeners at this point, to get down in the grass, to get down in your field, in the dirt, and look at the things around you. In Proverbs chapter 6, starting verse 6, he says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways, and be wise which, having no chief officer or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long, verse 9, will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little slumber, a little fortnight, a little holding of the hands to rest. And that's a word I inserted there. Your poverty, verse 11, will then come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. Solomon encourages us as we go through our life to take a few seconds and observe the natural world around us. And the beauty of this is not necessarily seen in just the end. It's the ability to look at things the way that God constructed them. God created the ants, just like he created everything else. And if you look at the ants, of which there are billions of them in the entire world, then you will notice certain characteristics. That number one, they have no designated ruler amongst them. And yet, one by one, they follow the line to do what is necessary to preserve their harvest from day in and day out. There's an order to their life. There's a responsibility. There's an accountability. And so he says here in this passage that the very first thing you can take from this ant is the ability to have self-responsibility, to understand what your role is in the world around you. Take your ant, look at the ant, look at the world around you, observe everyday life, and see the lessons that we can pull from that. In Proverbs chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20, starting in verse 1. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 20, starting at verse 1. He says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. The terror of a king, however, is like the growling of a lion. He who provokes him to anger forfeits his own life. Keep away from the strife is an honor for a man, but any fool will quarrel. The slugger doesn't plow after the autumn, so he begs during the harvest and has nothing. A plan in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out. Verses 1 through 4 of Proverbs chapter 20 talk about the observations that we can make in every life. Wine makes somebody act a certain way. The behavior of a king introduces certain narratives into the equation. But notice what he says in verse 5. He says, a man of understanding, or I'm sorry, a plan is deep in the heart of a man. But a man of understanding draws it out. There's two applications you can make with that. Number one, that all of our plans reside deep inside of ourselves. And we need to have the understanding to pull them out and maximize them. The second interpretation is, as we look at the world around us, it takes a person of understanding to pull those ideas out from the world around them. The world is giving us lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson. We can see it in the eyes of our friends. We can see it in our coworkers. We can see it in our family members. And if we will but listen to these things, then we will gain a wealth of wisdom in our life to put the things that we know on a knowledge level, on an academic level, into action in everyday life. Look a few chapters later at the demonstration of this. Proverbs chapter 23. This is especially pertinent for those who are leaving the high school stage of their life. But in Proverbs chapter 23, starting in verse 29, it says, Who has wealth? 
everybody does at some point. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Well, here's who it is. Verse 30. Those who linger long over wine. Those who go to taste mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red and when it sparkles in the cup when it goes down smoothly. At the very last, it bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your mind will utter perverse things. And you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the ocean. Or like one who lies down the top of a mast. They struck me, verse 35, but I didn't become ill. They beat me, but I didn't know it. When shall I wake? I'll seek another drink. <clears throat> there are a whole host of sermons you can find online and have been preached from this pulpit about the dangers of alcoholism. That's not what this point is right now. The point is, is from Paul Solomon's perspective, is that he looks at those who are given this type of thing, and he, he enumerates all the dangers of it. He talks about the wasted potential. He talks about the lunacy of laying down in the ocean. He talks about the fact that it impacts your bodily body to the point where you can't even function. And yet at the end of it, in verse 35, the only thing that that person can think afterwards is, let's go do that again. And yet when we look around, do we not see people that do that? Even if you're a working professional, you see that in your coworkers sometimes. We see that in our friends that we have in the world around us, where it seems like there's just vain pursuit of something that is literally destroying your body. And yet we're just going to keep on giving ourselves over to it. And the people that have discerning will look at that and say to themselves, I don't want any part of that because it is insanity. The same thing happens in Proverbs chapter 7. We're not going to read the entire chapter. Look at what he says here in Proverbs chapter 7. This is the great harlot chapter, or the horrible harlot chapter. Proverbs chapter 7, starting verse 1. He begins a very testy subject, Solomon does. I think speaking from his own personal experience in a lot of ways. Proverbs 7 and verse 1, he says, My son, you need to keep the words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and thy teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. Call understanding your intimate friend. Four verses that talk about holding wisdom and application near and dear to your soul. The specific application here in verse 5 is that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. For the next 20 verses, Solomon details point by point the tragedy that unfolds in front of him. Whether he's speaking allegorically, whether he's speaking from firsthand experience, whatever the situation is, he looks at the situation as it unfolds and he says this happens first. Number one, a woman walks down the street. Number two, a man walks down the street. Neither one of them are seeking anything good. Number three, they meet, and you have this rapturous love that only will end, as he, she deceives him later down the road, will only end in their death. And what Solomon says here in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, is keep the wisdom of this moment deep inside your heart. Because when your emotions are telling you one thing, your mind needs to tell you something different. You jump down to verse 24, he gives the conclusion of this. He says, now therefore, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Don't let your heart turn aside to her way. Do not stray into her path, for many are the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, descending to the very chambers of death. How many people do you know have been ruined by an incident like this? How many great men and women of God have had their souls absolutely annihilated by something like this? The moment of lust. That moment of emotion where you think, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to really give myself over to that, that needs to be replaced by knowledge of what happens. Look for lessons in everyday objects. Look to the world around you and see the wisdom that comes from knowledge as it's put into action. I would tell you number this, or this number two. I'm not Solomon. A successful life takes time, and it takes discipline. I want to ask everybody in this room this morning, not just those who are graduating. You can pretend you're graduating if you want to. But I want to ask everybody in the room this morning this one question. How do you define success? I actually did hear this from a commencement speech, so maybe I misspoke one earlier. But how do you define success? And a lot of us would essentially say the things that everybody wants to say. Oh, I define success by a life that's full of contentment and peace and happiness when you're married, three kids, white picket fence, gold retriever, I want all of those things. Ford Bronco was included somewhere in that idyllic life. That's what I want. But our actions sometimes dictate something else. Because in that relentless pursuit of success, however we define that, things get compromised along the way. And at some points we'll say to ourselves, well, instead of having the right friends, what I really want is all the friends. 
And instead of having a right stewardship of the money that I do have, what I want is all the money I can find. And instead of having the career that makes me content with my life where I can wake up and have the ideals that are important to me and do my job and find satisfaction, what I really want is that career that takes me to the top of the echelon. That's what I want. When in reality, a successful life is defined by Solomon on a number of different levels. For instance, how you accomplish that success. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21 says, An inheritance is gained hurriedly at the beginning will not be blessed in the end. It's defined by being okay with how your life is actually built. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 22. A man with an evil eye hastens after wealth and does not know that want will come upon him. You hasten after it. You don't realize that that's a never-ending pursuit. By talking less and doing more. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. And all labor there is profit. But mere talk leads only to poverty. That's one of my pet peeves. People that talk instead of doing things. Which I know is ironic because I'm a talker. But in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. And all labor there is profit. But mere talk leads only to poverty. Proverbs chapter 23, and verse 4. By learning, when enough is enough. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Just cease from your consideration. Anybody who has lived longer than 10 seconds knows that there are people in this world who will never be, can never be satisfied with the things that are in front of their face. That the life that they live now, as amazing as it is, not only historically speaking, as every other human being that's ever lived, but also in the sphere of our own world and our own universe right here amongst our friends, an amazing life. That contentedness still escapes them. Proverbs chapter 27, starting in verse 23. He talks about when enough is enough. And how you truly can define a successful life. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. Know well the condition of your flock. Pay attention to your herds. For riches are not forever. Nor does a crown endure to all generations. And when the grass disappears and the new growth is seen and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will be for your clothing and the goats will bring the price of the field. And there will be goat's milk enough for your food, for the food of your household and the sustenance of your mate. Ecclesiastes we're only going to get into in the next point. But Ecclesiastes is my favorite book, and I know I say that in every lesson, but Ecclesiastes is my favorite book because it talks about the pursuit of this on a much bigger scale. If you want to see Proverbs 27, 23 to 27, extrapolated, read Ecclesiastes. Because at the end of it, what he talks about is that all of these things that I put so much effort into it, they all just seem to fall by the wayside in their own unique way. And at the end of my life, Ecclesiastes 12, Whenever my teeth are going bad, whenever I'm bent over at the back because of age, and whenever I don't see as well, whenever I can't taste as well as I used to, when those things escape me, the only thing that really matters is whether or not I feared God and kept his commandments. And Solomon talks on at least three different occasions in the book of Ecclesiastes about how the only thing that he finds that gives himself real, long-lasting contentment is just enjoying your family. Spending time with the wife of your youth, as he phrases in Ecclesiastes, being content with your fields. Not looking at the other fields. Being content with your cars. That is actually Ecclesiastes. There is he. Not for us. Being content with your possessions. The things that you have. The things that you do. Successful life takes time and discipline to build. And if you try to shortchange that process, that success will be skewed in a way that you won't be happy with. And finally, he tells the people to retain a healthy fear of God. There's a lot of people that will leave. Once their commencement address is over and into the next stage of their life, and whether that's into the workforce, or whether that's into college, or whether it's in the first grade, there are a lot of people that will bring different opinions to your life that you've never heard before, things that you never would have imagined. Let me tell you something right now about those opinions. Not all of these worldviews are created in And some of these things that people will say to you and things that they will attest as the absolute truth, barring everything else, oftentimes will not be considered. When I was 18 or 19, actually, I left... Amarillo moved 10 hours away to East Texas, and in so many ways, it was a completely different universe for anything I'd ever expected. And being in conversation with people after class, before class, and dorms, it opened my eyes to a whole lot of things that I'd never really seen before, both good and bad. And then, of course, a few years after that, I moved up to Greenville, and then just everything went haywire, obviously, after that. But there are certain things you learn along the way in your life. And it's very easy to say and get confirmation bias to these things and say, well, because this person said this or because I respect this, and that's obviously the way that it has to be. And that's just simply not true. But in everything that you do and wherever you go and whatever you learn and whatever aspect of life, at the very least, retain a healthy fear of God. And the reason is, 
is because when you're at that brink of leaving God completely, and there will come a time in every person's life, at some point, not thankfully, but in every person's life, probably, when you're questioning your commitment to God, whether it's an illness, whether it's a tragedy, whether it's just an awakening or whatever it is, but there will come a moment in your life when you begin to ask yourself, is any of this really worth it? And in the back of your mind, that healthy fear of God that you have, that he is there, that he is all-powerful and knows everything, that will pull you back from the edge. I so often think of the parable of the prodigal son. And how the prodigal son found his way in completely throwing off everything that his father and his household had taught him and leaves the house and goes and wastes his life with riotous living. And he finds himself later in that story sitting in a pig pen, giving food to the pig. And it's at that point that that healthy fear of God, that healthy fear of his father, kicks in and he thinks to himself, why am I sitting here? What is this all about? And it may come a point in your own life when you're knee deep in sloth and you're thinking to yourself, how do I get my life out of this? That you remember that God is there and that he's always waiting for you. Solomon would dedicate the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. And in verse 27 of 1 Kings chapter 8, he talks about, which is very interesting considering a temple that's designed to worship God. He talks for 20 plus verses about the relationship that man has with God. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 27, he says, But will God, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven can't contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Talking about the temple. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant, to his supplication, talking about the humility of man. To listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you. That your eyes, verse 29, may be open towards this house night and day. Toward the place of which you have said, my name shall be there. To listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray towards this place. Listen to the supplication of your servant of your people Israel. When they pray towards this place, hear in heaven your dwelling place. Hear and forgive. You know what he's saying there? First Kings chapter 8, 27 through 29, what Solomon is saying is, I know people are going to go away from you. I know it. And when these people come crawling back to the temple, seeking your favor, what I'm praying for, God, Solomon says, is you to listen to me. They don't deserve it. They spurned you, went their own way. They said they hated you. They did this. They did that. But I'm praying, God, that you would hear them. In 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 31, or 31, he gives specific situations in which this could take place. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath, and he comes and takes an oath before your altar in this house, then hear in heaven, and act and judge your servant, condemning the wicked by bringing his way on his own head, justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. When your people, verse 33, Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, if they turn to you again and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel. Bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. When the heavens are shut up and there's no rain because they have sinned against you. And they pray towards this place, confess your name, and turn from their sin when you afflict them. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants and of your people Israel. Indeed, teach them the good way in which they should walk. Send rain on your land, which you have given your people for an inheritance. When these people turn away from you, when people do what people do, and they sin, and they find themselves in swamp up to their eyeballs, and yet they crawl out of that pig pen and they put one finger on the floor of your temple. Hear them, God. I'll tell you this much. The only way that somebody gets from the slot to that temple is by retaining that healthy fear. So no matter where you go, no matter what you do, the ideal is for everyone to be faithful to God 24-7. That's the ideal for all of us. But at the very least, retain that healthy fear of God. It's been said that there are 365 occasions inside scripture where God says, don't fear anything. I have no idea if that's true. It makes for good preaching fodder, obviously. But it does say a lot in scripture not to fear anything. One of the things that you do fear, according to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 24, is God. For this exact reason. Proverbs chapter 15, starting in verse 24. Listen to what he says here, starting in these verses. Proverbs chapter 15, starting verse 24. It says, The path of the life leads upward for the wise, that he may keep away from Sheol the wall. The Lord will tear down the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. Evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant words of terror. 
He who profits illicitly troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Bright eyes gladden the heart. Good news puts fat on the bones. I've been having a lot of good news lately. He who's here listens to the life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. He who neglects discipline despises himself, but he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. The fear of the Lord, verse 33, one of the most oft-repeated verses in this entire book. The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. <laughs> fear of the Lord is the beginning of everything, which is why we started in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, by talking about the humility it takes to actually start learning things in everyday life. But once we have that fear of God, then we can begin learning, because we recognize that only he knows everything. And that no matter what it takes, no matter where I am in my life, I can always, as long as I'm humble, crawl my way back to him. I don't have to fear that life. I don't have to fear what's around me. The only thing I need to fear is God. As Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who can destroy the body and the soul and help forever. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I wanted to just make the entire lesson from Ecclesiastes. I chose not. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Solomon talks about how the end of life and about the pursuit of success and the abandonment of wisdom, all the things that we all do with our 75, hopefully 80 plus years of life if we're lucky enough to have them. All these things find their culmination in one grand event at the end. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, starting in verse 16. He says, Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. And I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. For a time, for every matter, and for every deed is there. I said to myself, concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. You would think so. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over the beast for all his vanity. Listen to this in verse 20. All then go to the same place. All came from dust, and all return to dust. It may be this morning that your fear of God is not rooted in obedience. It's not rooted from anything I have to say. It's not even rooted in anything Scripture has to say. Where you look at it and you say, okay, I don't believe Brady, I don't believe this Bible, I don't believe anybody else. That fear of God, though, can still be rooted in the omnipresence of death. That no matter what your ideology is, and no matter what your success rate is in business, and no matter how big your house is, that is the thing that finishes us all. And if that's the only thing that pulls you back from the brink and starts you on your path towards God, then that's enough for that moment. Because that will lead you on the path towards God that then goes with hope and grace and love and repentance, obedience and birth, all the other things we talk about. Retain that healthy fear of God however you have to. Whether that's with Scripture, whether that's with your friends, or whether that's with death itself. Retain that healthy fear of God and knowledge that we will all meet Him someday. As long as we keep that, then everything else, hopefully, will fall into place behind that. One step at a time, one day at a time. Obviously, I'm not Solomon. I didn't steal everything from this lesson from what he had to say. So he is the one that is kind of the star of the show this morning. But these are words that are not said by somebody who didn't live much of a life. They just kind of stayed in their house all the time, scrolling on Facebook, and that's that. That's not the kind of person Solomon. For all of his warts and for all of his faults, Solomon lived a hundred lifetimes in the span that most of us would take one. And he learned a lot of things from it. Most of them bad, but a lot of them good. But what he ultimately did in his work was he looked back and gave us the benefit of that reflection. A man who explored every corner of what life had to offer. And at the end of it, said the only thing that really matters is whether you serve God or not. Whether you fear him and keep his... That's the only really thing that matters. And so if you're here this morning and you've kind of taken the back roads of life, and you've skewed your direction towards things that ultimately will end in oblivion, then I would encourage you to take the road back towards God. Help him. Be with him. If we can help you with 